Fifty-five. The spirit of gravity. Zarathustra is on his own, climbing up his mountain and talking to himself. His mind now starts to wander back and remember his journey and what he learned. This chapter is dedicated to his arch nemesis, the spirit of gravity. One. My mouthpiece is of the people. Too coarsely and cordially do I talk for Angora rabbits, and still stranger soundeth my word unto all inkfish and pen foxes. My hand is a fool's hand. Woe unto all tables and walls, and whatever hath room for fool's sketching, fool's scrawling. My foot is a horse foot. Therewith do I trample and trot over stick and stone, in the fields up and down, and am bedeviled with delight in all fast racing. Sarthusta begins with some self-denigrating. He admits that his speech is sometimes too coarse, his portrayals too sensational, his treading too reckless. He is not a refined philosopher. As philosophers go, he is more like a wild boot. My stomach is surely an eagle's stomach, for it prefereth lamb's flesh. Certainly it is a bird's stomach. Nourished with innocent things and with few, ready and impatient to fly, to fly away, that is now my nature. Why should there not be something of bird nature therein? And especially that I am hostile to the spirit of gravity, that is bird nature. Verily deadly hostile, supremely hostile, originally hostile. O whither hath my hostility not flown and misflown? The metaphor means that he is not someone who gorges himself on an idea. He just tastes a little bit of it, consumes what he needs, and then flies off to the next idea. We've met other metaphors that said essentially the same, in which he likened himself to someone who dances on mountaintops or flies with sprites. This way of philosophizing may not go very deep, but it makes his spirit light and thus keeps away the spirit of gravity. The spirit of gravity is the thing he hates the most, and here he admits that sometimes this hostility made him fly to the wrong places, just to escape it. Thereof could I sing a song, and will sing it, though I be alone in an empty house and must sing it to mine own ears. Other singers are there, to be sure, to whom only the full house maketh the voice soft, the hand eloquent, the eye expressive, the heart wakeful, those do I not resemble. Like the previous chapter, this chapter has two parts. The first, short part, is the introduction. He ends it by telling us that he is going to sing about this hostility that he has. The second part is going to tell us about the spirit of gravity and why it is so important to keep defeating it. Two. He who one day teacheth men to fly will have shifted all landmarks. To him will all landmarks themselves fly into the air. The earth will he christen anew as the light body. The ostrich runneth faster than the fastest horse, but it also thrusteth its head heavily into the heavy earth. Thus is it with the man who cannot yet fly. Heavy unto him are earth and life, and so willeth the spirit of gravity. But he who would become light and be a bird must love himself. Thus do I teach. The ostrich metaphor is a particularly good one. The ostrich can run very fast, but it chooses instead, so the myth goes, to stick its head deep in the ground. Contemporary man is the same. Instead of running fast and flying like a bird, the human spirit prefers to dig deep. The thinkers that are eulogized are the deep thinkers, those who take an idea and dig all the way into it, creating monumental systems of thought. This was particularly true of the German spirit, that created thinkers like Leibniz, Hegel and Marx. It is the spirit of gravity that makes them think this way, and it turns earthly life into a heavy burden. Zarathustra wants to teach us to fly, and for that, the first thing we have to learn is to love ourselves, love the earthly body that we are. Not to be sure with the love of the sick and infected, for with them stinketh even self-love. One must learn to love oneself, thus do I teach, with a wholesome and healthy love. 
that one may endure to be with oneself and not go roving about. Such roving about christeneth itself brotherly love. With these words hath there hitherto been the best lying and dissembling, and especially by those who have been burdensome to everyone. To love yourself, you must be an individualist who develops his spirit and strengthens it until it enjoys its own existence. Those who fail to do so become sick and weak in body and spirit, and then they are incapable of loving themselves, and instead commit to love their fellow man. But we already know what this love is worth. When people who hate themselves commit to loving others, their loving words conceal resentment and jealousy. And verily, it is no commandment for today and tomorrow to learn to love oneself, Rather is it of all arts the finest, subtlest, last, and patientest. For to its possessor is all possession well concealed, and of all treasure pits one's own is last excavated, so causeth the spirit of gravity. Loving oneself, however, is not easy. To love yourself, you must first know yourself. You must excavate the treasures buried deep inside you. Why are they buried so deep? Because human culture, guided by the spirit of gravity, has repressed those treasures. Almost in the cradle are we apportioned with heavy words and worths, good and evil. So calleth itself this dowry. For the sake of it we are forgiven for living. And therefore suffereth one little children to come unto one, to forbid them betimes to love themselves, so causeth the spirit of gravity. Instead of everyone developing their own unique talent and creating their values and virtues on that basis, the spirit of gravity taught us to believe that there are absolute good and evil, that we all must obey. Hence, we repress our unique qualities and follow an external system of morality instead. Zarathustra paraphrases Jesus, to show how this indoctrination begins at a very early age. And we, we bear loyally what is apportioned unto us, on hard shoulders over rugged mountains, and when we sweat, then do people say to us, Yea, life is hard to bear. But man himself only is hard to bear. The reason thereof is that he carrieth too many extraneous things on his shoulders. Like the camel kneeleth he down, and letteth himself be well laden especially the strong, load-bearing man in whom reverence resideth. Too many extraneous heavy words and worths loadeth he upon himself, then seemeth life to him a desert. It is all of these external values that are foisted upon us that nail us to the ground, prevent us from flying, and make life hard to bear. Man, as he was constructed by Western civilization, is like a camel that carries too much burden and his life becomes a desert. We've met the metaphor of the camel before, in a more positive way. It is the first of the three metamorphoses of the spirit, and Zarathustra told us that we should load external values on ourselves, and that we should run to the desert. But this was only the first stage. The spirit then needs to metamorphose into a lion, and fight to refute all those values, developing its own powers in the process. Then you reach the third stage, that of the child, with nothing burdening you, and with powers to create new values. Those who are guided by the spirit of gravity, however, don't go through the metamorphosis, and remain camels, stuck in the deserts. And verily, many a thing also that is our own is hard to bear, and many internal things in man are like the oyster, repulsive and slippery and hard to grasp, so that an elegant shell with elegant adornment must plead for them. But this art also must one learn, to have a shell and a fine appearance and sagacious blindness. Again it deceiveth about many things in man that many a shell is poor and pitiable, and too much of a shell. Much concealed goodness and power is never dreamt of. The choicest dainties find no tasters. Women know that, the choicest of them, a little fatter, a little leaner. Oh, how much fate is in so little. The animal metaphors continue, 
and I think it is intentional, part of Zarathustra's commitment to the earth, that he keeps comparing attributes of the human spirit to earthly animals. With the oyster metaphor, he turns to talk about our inner powers. Before, it seemed like he was saying that our inside is good, but here he warns us that there is much to be repulsed about in it as well. But there is also a lot of hidden good, and one should learn to create a shell for themselves, meaning their character and virtues, that makes this good shine. It is a fine art, and easy to get wrong, to channel your inner powers and create something beautiful out of them. Man is difficult to discover, and unto himself most difficult of all. Often lieth the spirit concerning the soul, so causeth the spirit of gravity. He, however, hath discovered himself who saith, This is my good and evil. Therewith hath he silenced the mole and the dwarf who say, Good for all, evil for all. Our spirit has been loaded with external values, pretending to be universal, and because of it, it is hard for the individual to see the particular qualities that he possesses. We have to surpass this state of mind by unearthing these unique powers. The mole and the dwarf, as we remember, are two faces of the spirit of gravity, as it was described in the chapter, The Vision and the Enigma. Verily neither do I like those who call everything good, and this world the best of all. Those do I call the all-satisfied. All-satisfiedness, which knoweth how to taste everything, that is not the best taste. I honor the refractory, fastidious tongues and stomachs, which have learned to say, I and yea, and nay. To chew and digest everything, however, that is the genuine swine nature. Ever to say yea, that hath only the ass learnt, and those like it. This seems to go against what Nietzsche said in The Gay Science. In Aphorism 276, Nietzsche comes to a New Year's resolution that I wish to be at any time hereafter only a ye-sayer. He meant that he didn't want to hate anything in existence, but embrace earthly life in its fullness. It was a project he challenged himself with, to learn how to affirm everything. Here, he seems to be denigrating those who do exactly that. But we need to remember what else was said in that aphorism. He stated that there are still ugly and repulsive things in the world, but his reaction to them would simply be to look away. This is different from the people he portrays here, who give up on their refined taste so they can learn to enjoy things of bad taste as well. What he promotes is keeping your individual refined taste, trying to transform things that are ugly and tasteless into beautiful and tasteful. But if you fail, simply learn to ignore them. Deep yellow and hot red, so wanteth my taste. It mixeth blood with all colors, he, however, who whitewasheth his house, betrayeth unto me a whitewashed soul. With mummies, some fall in love, others with phantoms, both alike hostile to all flesh and blood. Oh, how repugnant are both to my taste, for I love blood. His aesthetic taste demands that everything would be made with blood, meaning that it would be an expression of earthly life. That is the most beautiful. And there will I not reside and abide where every one spitteth and speweth. That is now my taste. Rather would I live amongst thieves and perjurers. Nobody carrieth gold in his mouth. Still more repugnant unto me, however, are all lickspittles, and the most repugnant animal of man that I found did I christen parasite. It would not love, and would yet live by love. Unhappy do I call all those who have only one choice— either to become evil beasts or evil beast tamers. Amongst such would I not build my tabernacle. Here he tells us about the type of people that are ugly and repulsive to him. As we see, his solution is not to wage war on them, but simply to avoid them. Unhappy do I also call those who have ever to wait. They are repugnant to my taste. All the toll-gatherers and traders and kings and other land-keepers and shopkeepers. Verily I learned waiting also, and thoroughly so, but only waiting for myself. And above all did I learn standing and walking and running and leaping and climbing and dancing. 
Another type of people who are repugnant to him are those involved in the trading of products and defending of property. He characterizes them as those who wait. I think he means that they find no joy in the work itself and are waiting for the benefits they will reap from earning money. He, on the other hand, takes joy in his self and in developing his body. When he waits for something, it is for his own spirit to produce new ideas, which he can then use for further development. This, however, is my teaching. He who wisheth one day to fly must first learn standing and walking and running and climbing and dancing. One doth not fly into flying. With rope ladders learned I to reach many a window. With nimble legs did I climb high masts. To sit on high masts of perception seemed to me no small bliss. To flicker like small flames on high masts, a small light, certainly, but a great comfort to cast away sailors and shipwrecked ones. In the previous segment he talked about developing and training the body. If one wishes to fly, they must first go through this process. You have to try everything out, put yourself through tests and experiences, to grow in body and spirit. Only when you are powerful can you try to fly. By diverse ways and wendings did I arrive at my truth. Not by one ladder did I mount to the height where mine eye roveth into my remoteness. And unwillingly only did I ask my way. That was always counter to my taste. Rather did I question and test the ways themselves. This says the same thing. Note, though, that he talks about his way of life as his truth. In Nietzsche's philosophy, Truth is not universal and eternal. It is different for every individual, and different for every time and place. Zarathustra, through all his experiments, found his own truth. Our truth can be something similar, which is why we can learn from him. But it is still something that we have to discover on our own, after putting ourselves through the wire. A testing and a questioning hath been all my travelling. And verily, one must also learn to answer such questioning. That, however, is my taste. Neither a good nor a bad taste, but my taste, of which I have no longer either shame or secrecy. This is now my way. Where is yours? Thus did I answer those who asked me the way, for the way it doth not exist. Thus spake Zarathustra. Zarathustra is beyond good and evil. Good and evil are concepts created by the spirit of gravity that makes us believe that there is such a thing as universal good and bad. People who are affected by the spirit ask him for the way for the true and the good, but there is no such thing as the way. Everyone has to go their own way, developing their own attributes and virtues, finding their own truth and their own good. Thus, you shake away the weight of the universal concepts foisted upon you, and elevate yourself above the things that you find false, bad, and ugly. With your spirit so weightless and elevated, you can start to fly. <laughs>